<laughs> accountability. So we're going to start with the chapter of accountability because by the accountability, you're obligated to do things and obligated to refrain from things. Without accountability, you wouldn't be obligated to do anything or to refrain from anything. There is a consensus that sanity and pubescence are conditions for taklif, accountability. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Rufi'a al-qalam an thalatha. The angel's pen is lifted from three. From who sleeps until awaking. And from the child, and from the child until a wet dream. And from the insane until he can think. As for insanity, which would prevent accountability, it either remained from after puberty until one died insane, meaning from the time he reached puberty, he was insane, and then he died like that, or one was sane and pubescent for a time, but then went insane after pubescence. The first shall enter paradise without torture, whose insanity was existing from the time of pubescence. And then he died like that. And the other will be judged on judgment day for any days of accountability. As for pubescence, whoever dies before puberty, which is by ejaculation, menstruation, or 15 lunar years, will not be responsible in the afterlife. Whoever dies before puberty will not be responsible in the afterlife. The children born to blasphemers do not believe blasphemy before mental discerning. When he comes out of his mother, that child, that baby doesn't believe blasphemy and he doesn't know anything. And even if they did afterwards, if they did believe blasphemy after mental discerning, after tamiz, after becoming mumayyiz, like eight years old, nine years old, and he believes in blasphemy, but died before puberty, they will not enter hell. Such children will not enter hell because pubescence is a condition for accountability. However, those children are, in judgment, blasphemers by consensus. The children born to blasphemers, they are, in judgment, blasphemers, meaning that they are handled as the people of their religion are handled, such as not being buried in the Muslim cemetery, that child who doesn't even believe in blasphemy, born to blasphemer parents, would not be buried in a Muslim cemetery because this child has the judgment of a blasphemer. Not the conviction of a blasphemer, the judgment of the religious judgment of a blasphemer. Thus, they are neither buried in Muslim cemeteries nor prayed for after death. According to Abu Hanifa and the Maturidiyah, the belief in Allah is obligatory not due to a third condition of hearing the two shahadas. So the two conditions that we mentioned so far, like we just said, that's the consensus. All the scholars of Islam agree that sanity and pubescence are conditions for accountability. Abu Hanifa and the Maturidis, they say that believing in Allah is obligatory not due to a third condition of hearing the two shahadas, but merely due to the fitrah, which is the khilqah, the nature or the natural disposition installed in the human. That fitrah that makes no sane pubescent one excused for being ignorant about the creator, according to them, sanity and pubescence is enough for having to believe in the creator, according to them.
the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitrah. Every child is born on the fitrah. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ It is his parents who make him a Jew, Christian, or magus. Those are the Persian fire worshippers. They, meaning Abu Hanifa and his followers, said that indeed this is the very me, Thaq, and Ahd, the covenant of Allah, to all the descendants of Adam, it is about this exaltation of who created them that they were made to testify against themselves. They, Abu Hanifa and his followers, mean here the apparent meaning of Allah's saying, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ And when your Lord brought the children of Adam's offsprings from their backs, وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ And made them testify against themselves, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your Lord? They said, indeed, we have testified. According to this way, the pubescent, sane people have no excuse for not knowing or realizing the existence of their Lord who molded them. And according to this way, it is valid that their testimony, they said, indeed, was not an actual pronunciation. It wasn't actually an uttered word. It's possible. It's valid, Yani. It's valid according to this way. What, what way? The way of saying it's enough to be accountable to believe in God that you're sane and pubescent. According to this way, then, when they said, Bala, indeed, what was the question? Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? So they answered that, Bala, indeed. According to this way that to be accountable to believe in God, you only have to be sane and pubescent. Then how do they explain this ayah? It is valid according to them that their saying indeed was not an actual pronunciation. It is the perfection of their creation doing the confessing. And this is what Al-Maturidi says, that the creation, composure, and structure of every human testifies to the existence of the alive, powerful, unique one. So according to this way, it's not that they verbally said Bala, but it is that their being and the way they are created testifies. It's as if their creation is saying, Bella, indeed, you are our Lord. For this, Allah said, And there are signs within yourselves. Do you not use your minds? There are signs within yourselves for what? For the oneness of God. Signs within yourselves that tell you that you are created by someone. Like what? Like the fact that the movement of your hand is a voluntary motion, while the beating of your heart is involuntary, although all of that is your body. And like the fact that you eat and drink from one inlet and they come out from two different outlets. These are signs within yourselves that there is a creator. So according to Abu Hanifa and his followers, a person is obligated to believe in the oneness of Allah merely by being sane and pubescent. And if he dies, 
as a stone worshiper or an atheist, then he shall be in hell forever, according to them, even without the message of a prophet. There is no difference between them and the other scholars concerning other than the monotheism, meaning they limited that obligation. The Hanafis, Abu Hanifa and his followers, his Maturidi followers, they limited this discussion that we're having right now to monotheism, just believing in God. But concerning other than believing in God, there is no difference between them and the other scholars when it comes to accountability. Because those subjects cannot be reached by the mind alone, knowing that there's a prophet and other things. Yani, no matter how hard one thinks, he cannot know that there are prophets on his own. He can know that there's a God, but he can't know for sure that there are prophets. However, once one knows that there were prophets, the mind necessitates that they would need certain qualities to fulfill their mission, such as impeccability and miracles. So according to all of them, all scholars of Islam, the other matters are not obligatory on an individual unless the call of Islam reaches him, the basic meaning of the shahada. The majority said, this would mean that there is some accountability due to the mere minds which is untrue because there is no evidence in the mere minds or morals, what people claim are morals. There's no evidence in that. There is no way for the mere mind to know any obligation whatsoever. Had there been a way for it to know any obligation, there would have been a way for the mind to know every obligation because an obligation is an obligation. So rather accountability to believe in Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to believe in Allah, even the monotheism of God and his messenger is by a third condition, according to the majority, receiving the basic message of Islam that no one is God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their proof was that Allah said, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We do not punish until sending a messenger. The Ash'ariyah interpret this verse to mean, Allah does not punish in the afterlife unless a messenger's message reaches one. Abu Hanifa interprets this, yani he has to have a different interpretation for this. If this is what the Ash'aris use to prove that accountability needs a third condition in all cases according to them, then how does Abu Hanifa explain this ayah if he believes that accountability to believe in God only requires two conditions? Abu Hanifa interprets this as the torture of annihilation or extermination of a people in the present life. The torture of extermination such as the torture of the tribes of Ad and Thamud. So here you got Abu Hanifa's interpretation of the ayah. This is important here. What's happening here? So we have been learned about accountability. We learned that accountability has three conditions, right? All these years. To be sane, pubescent, and to have heard the basic message of Islam. Now, we just took that, according to Abu Hanifa and his followers, to believe in God, there are only two conditions to be accountable. Sanity and pubescence. 
So if that's their position, and this is Islam, the correct religion, that means that their argument has to be consistent all the way through. They can't be ignoring proofs or contradicting themselves, right? So then we just produced the other saying that you need three conditions for accountability in all cases. Believing in God and otherwise. So, but all the proofs are the same proofs, right? The Quran, we agree about the Quran, the text of the Quran, we don't disagree about it. So these Ash'aris who use an ayah from the Quran to prove a third condition that the Hanafis didn't count. Well, how do the Hanafis explain that? So you as a learner, when you hear about these different sayings and you hear the proof of one of them, then you should be curious, that how did the other group answer that proof? Because for sure they weren't just being stubborn and ignoring proofs, right? So for sure they weren't contradicting themselves because they were guided imams. So that's how you understand both ways. You have to understand the consistency in both madhabs. So it's one ayah, but two different sayings. So that means one way will explain the ayah. One madhab will explain the ayah one way. And one madhab will explain the same ayah in another way. So that each respective madhab will not be in itself inconsistent. I hope that's clear for you. If that's not clear, let me know. So how does Abu Hanifa explain this ayah that the Ash'aris are using to prove that there's a third condition for accountability? He interprets this as the torture of extermination of a people in the present life. Such as the torture of the tribes of Ad and Thamud. So then his argument is still consistent. He hasn't contradicted himself yet. This ayah is not, according to his interpretation, is not refuting him. For the Ash'aris, this ayah is refuting Abu Hanifa. But for Abu Hanifa, this ayah doesn't refute him because it means not the way the Ash'aris are explaining it. The majority said, had there been a confirmed obligation before the coming of a messenger, there would be no safety from punishment for leaving out that obligation. Because it's an obligation, so there should be a consequence if there's an obligation. So had there been a confirmed obligation, according to Abu Hanifa and his followers, there is a confirmed obligation even without the coming of a messenger, which is to believe in the oneness of God. So then there would be no safety from punishment for leaving out that obligation. And that's what they say. They say if he died like that, he will be in hell forever, even without the message of a messenger. But then that would be like punishing them without first putting them on the earth to even do any good, any bad deeds. That would be like punishing them, making them accountable, even without a messenger, would be like punishing them without first putting them on earth to do bad deeds. As God said, Had we devastated them with punishment before trying them in the present life, the dunya, they would have said, Our Lord, if only you had sent to us a messenger. If only you had sent to us a messenger. See there, that evidence in there? This is the argument they would have for God had there been punishment without messengers. Had there been punishment without messengers, they would have said, oh Allah, had only you sent to us a messenger. That argument, which also is mentioned in God's saying, 
رسلا مبشرين ومنذرين لئلا يكون للناس على الله حجة لئلا يكون للناس على الله حجة بعد الرسل messengers as givers of glad tidings and as warners so that the people would not have any argument for Allah after the messengers. Therefore, we say, yani, the majority says, and th those are the Ash'aris, that Abu Hanifa's position is weak in this case because his position confirms accountability without a messenger. And these verses show that Allah sent the messengers so that the people wouldn't say, oh Allah, had only you sent a messenger, had only you not punished us without a messenger. Allah clarified that there is no evidence for the creations except the saying of the messengers. Not the intellect. Therefore, there is safety from punishment before the coming of a messenger. And without one, without the coming of a messenger, we do not confirm reward or punishment from Allah for whoever did something or refrain from something. So then what about the ayah that Abu Hanifa used? How do the Ash'aris explain it? Their explanation for the verse, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدْنَا and when your Lord brought the children of Adam's offsprings from their backs and made them testify against themselves, am I not your Lord? They said, indeed, we have testified. So how do the majority explain this ayah, this ayah that Abu Hanifa uses as evidence that accountability to believe in God is not by a third condition? They say that this is about the day of Alastu, that day named after the statement, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? So that's called the day of Alastu, Yawm Alastu. At Na'manul Araq, when Allah extracted from the back of Adam the ant sized human shaped souls of all mankind, meaning, all the souls of the human beings, every human who would live, his soul came out of Adam's back having the size of ants and the shapes of humans, but not flesh, just soul. So Allah extracted from the back of Adam the ant-sized human-shaped souls of all mankind endowed them with intellect. He endowed those souls with intellect. This is how they're explaining this ayah. And he enabled them to speak. And he asked them, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And then they testified, Bala, indeed. According to them, this admission and testimony was an actual pronunciation uttered. They all confessed about the godhood of Allah. Our Shaykh said in the explanation of the Sirat, after Allah created Adam, he extracted the souls of his descendants from his back and then made them speak. And so they admitted to the godhood of Allah. The majority, they also said that the meaning of being born on the fitrah, how do they explain the hadith? How do the majority explain the hadith Kullu mawludin wulida al fitrah? The one that Abu Hanifa used. 
they also said that the meaning of being born on the fifth rock is that the child is born with a readiness and a preparation for the monotheism. The child is born in accordance with the state that their soul had. The child is born in accordance with the state that the soul had upon their confession to the godhood and oneness of Allah. Then upon the soul entering the body of the child, being blown into the fetus by the angel, it forgets this event. The soul forgets and remains forgetful about it, will never remember. He would later hear something, that human, that living child, he would later hear something from his parents or from others. If it were Islam, he would resort to the state he was on. He would basically, he would just fall back into what he was already ready for. And if it were blasphemy, then if he believed it, he would actually believe blasphemy in reality, that child. So, if it were Islam, he would resort to the state he was on, that child. He would fall back into what he was already ready for. If it were blasphemy, then if he believed it, because he still might not believe it, even if his people are blasphemers, that child might not believe the blasphemy, the shirk. But if he did, then he would actually believe blasphemy in reality. But without being accountable, without the message. Without the message of a prophet, he won't be accountable even after puberty. If he worshipped a stone and died without the message, he will not be responsible in the afterlife, according to the majority. It is not a condition that this person who received the basic call hears detailed rules of the religion or evidence. He doesn't have to hear detailed rules to be accountable, and he doesn't have to hear religious evidence to be accountable. Nor is it an excuse to think about the validity of Islam for some time. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not give the blasphemers time to think about Islam after conveying the message to them. Not a day or two, nor more. He considered that conveying the message to them, yani, a, 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 a statement that they understand. No one is God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He considered that conveying the message to them was sufficient for lifting their excuse. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One's fate depends on how his life ended. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The judgment of one's deeds in the hereafter depends on the state upon which one died. Wa subhanallahi wa bihamdihi.